I don't see how any thinking person could take the Bible seriously. That's what one of my advisors told me when I was working on my PhD in mathematics. Now, his specialty was mathematical physics. So he knew all kinds of things about quantum mechanics and particle physics and general relativity and all kinds of other topics. And he was convinced that whatever the Bible said, it could not be reconciled with modern science. Now, he's not the only one who feels this way. Popular science writer Neil deGrasse Tyson remarked, God is an ever receding pocket of scientific ignorance. In other words, God is just a myth that we invoke to try to explain what we haven't yet figured out scientifically. Richard Dawkins puts it even a little stronger. One of the truly bad effects of religion is that it teaches us that it is a virtue to be satisfied with not understanding. Now, the ancient psalmist had a very different take on God in the natural world. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Now, what are we to make of these two very different perspectives? Well, that's what we're going to unpack today. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord God, we give you thanks. God, we thank you for this world that we live in. God, we thank you that when we open up our hearts to you, Lord, you draw near to us. God, I pray that wherever we are today, you would come and meet us by your Holy Spirit. God, I pray that by your Spirit, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe all that you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in my experience, there are three big ideas that are shaping conversations about science and faith in our culture. Number one, modern science has made it clear that the biblical documents, specifically Genesis, are completely unreliable guides to reality. Number two, a scientific mindset and a religious mindset are fundamentally incompatible. A scientific mindset depends on empirical evidence and careful reasoning, whereas a religious mindset operates on blind faith or emotion. Number three, there is no scientific evidence that supports any aspect of the Christian faith. Now, are these claims true? We're going to consider them one at a time. Number one. Modern science has made it clear that the biblical documents, specifically Genesis, are completely unreliable guides to reality. Now, let me mention right from the get-go that I love science. My undergraduate degrees were in math and physics, and I loved learning about the natural world. Later on, I earned a PhD in mathematics, and my doctoral dissertation was in an area of mathematics related to quantum statistical mechanics. I think you would be truly impressed by how much mathematics I've already forgotten. Now, there's just something deeply satisfying about understanding how things work. I can still remember one of my favorite classes as an an undergraduate, Intermediate Mechanics. Now, in this class, we started with Newton's three laws of motions, and then we derived from the ground up all kinds of interesting results. For example, I know why it's way easier to balance on a fast-moving bicycle than it is on a slow-moving bicycle. I know why certain objects wobble out of control if you try to rotate them around a certain axis. I even know why the sky is blue. Parents, I can help you out. Now, science is so much fun, but it's also a lot more than that. I mean, modern science has enabled us to accomplish things that were unimaginable 3,000 years ago. I mean, we can video chat with people on the other side of the globe anytime we want. My daughter is in classes with people living in China. Now, I know we're all used to that now, but that is crazy. It's amazing that we can do that. We can actually travel to the other side of the globe in under 24 hours. I mean, in 1872, Jules Verne wrote a book titled Around the World in 80 Days because who could possibly get all the way around the globe in only 80 days? We can operate on babies while they're still in the womb. We can land unmanned vehicles on another planet and then get those vehicles to perform scientific experiments for us. I mean, if you're not impressed by science, 
You're just not paying attention. Now, given how much we know about our world through modern science, it's very reasonable to ask this question. Does modern science discredit what we find in the Bible? Does modern science discredit what we find in the Bible? Now, the answer depends a great deal on what the biblical documents are actually claiming. I mean, is a book like Genesis attempting to address modern scientific questions? Well, in the judgment of most scholars, no. But we come to the text with our own concerns, and we try to force the text to answer the questions that we wanted to answer. So, for example, because we idolize health and beauty, we look to the Bible to show us a diet that's going to help us stay healthy and trim. We think, oh, if I just eat what the ancient Israelites ate, then I'll stay healthy and trim. Well, newsflash, people in the ancient world were not trying to stay thin. They were trying to survive. We need to engage the text on its own terms, in its own cultural context. Now, consider the comments of Jack Collins, a theologically conservative Old Testament scholar. He writes this, In Genesis 1 through 11, we do not have even an attempt at a scientific account. It is not even what some call ancient science. One diagnostic for whether an ancient work is intended to be scientific is what people are expected to do with the statements. For example, does the communication itself invite people to affirm any details or to plan a journey based on the geography? In Genesis, we have something different. One goal of the storytelling in Genesis is to provide an alternative story to those told in other cultures of the ancient Near East, especially in Mesopotamia. Genesis aims to tell the story of beginnings the right way, to counter the other stories. It professes to offer the divinely authorized way for its audience to picture the events. In other words, the goal of the creation accounts in Genesis was not ancient or modern science. The goal was to answer big questions related to the nature of God and the pure purpose of human existence and how we can get along well in this world. Now, once we realize what's going on in Genesis, we discover that the statements made there are actually quite striking. I mean, Israel was a tiny people group on the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea. I mean, for centuries, they just lived in the shadow of one superpower after another, Egypt and Assyria and Babylon and Persia. And somehow, they ended up with shockingly unique views about deity. I mean, the things that they thought about the, about the world and about God and about human beings were strikingly different than all the people groups around them. Let me give you a few examples. All of Israel's pagan neighbors believe that the gods have competing agendas and limited jurisdiction. Even as a corporate body, the gods do not exercise ultimate sovereignty. And so the pagan gods were always getting in conflicts with one another. They were always jockeying for positions of power. Now, the Israelites, on the other hand, believe that Yahweh is the ultimate power in the universe. He answers to no one, and there are no limits on his jurisdiction. The book of Daniel puts it like this. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? Now, what about the character of deity? Well, Israel's neighbors believe that the gods are not bound by any code of conduct. They are inconsistent, unpredictable, and only marginally accountable to the divine assembly. In other words, all bets were off when it came to the pagan gods. I mean, you did not want to encounter a pagan god on a bad day. It could have disastrous results for you. Now, the Israelites believe that Yahweh is consistent in character and always acted in alignment with his attributes. In other words, he was always faithful. He was always loving. He was always just. He was always good. Here's what the psalmist writes. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. 
Now, what did the gods require of human beings? Well, most people in the ancient world believed that it was basically impossible to know. The gods did not, re- did not reveal what they required of human beings. So all you could do was try to infer their will from your fortunes. And this could make for some agonizing moments in life. The Israelites, however, believed that Yahweh had made his will known in detail through the giving of the law of Moses. The prophet Micah puts it like this. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Finally, what about human dignity? Well, most ancient Near Eastern cultures taught that human beings were an afterthought. They were created to be slaves. The only dignity they had derived from the fact that they were there to meet the needs of the gods. Now, the ancient Israelites believed that human dignity was bound up with the fact that we were created in the image of God and that God intended for us to rule over the created world. I mean, what the book of Genesis says in this regard is quite profound. God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Now, this perspective was unique in the ancient world. The Old Testament was not a scientific text. Even so, it communicates profound truths about God's nature, about human nature, about this world that we live in. And these truths were especially relevant in the ancient Near East. Now, we can actually say more than this. Even though the Old Testament is not a scientific document, the things that it shows us about the nature of reality actually paved the way for modern science to emerge in the 16th century. And this leads us to our next big claim. Many people believe that a scientific mindset and a religious mindset are fundamentally incompatible. They believe that a scientific mindset is all about empirical evidence and careful reasoning, and that a religious mindset operates on blind faith and emotion. Now, we should acknowledge that there are plenty of religious people who don't really care much about empirical evidence and are not so concerned about careful reasoning. And they might even describe their own religion as a step of blind faith or something that helps them emotionally. I mean, sometimes Christians will say things to me like, I don't really believe in all that big bang stuff. I believe God said it and bang, it happened. All right, well, not everybody is into science, obviously. But the real question is whether or not scientific thinking is fundamentally incompatible with having a mindset that also embraces the existence of God. Now, the historical record is extremely clear on this matter. The scientific revolution was birthed in a context that was profoundly shaped by biblical ideas. I mean, why? Why did science emerge and Christianize Europe and nowhere else? Medieval Europe was not the most advanced culture on the planet. I mean, there were other cultures that had better technology and higher degrees of learning. So why did modern science come about in this one place in Christianized Europe and nowhere else? Well, authors Nancy Percy and Charles Thaxton say this, The historian is bound to ask why. Why did Christianity form the matrix within which this novel approach to the natural world developed? The source itself seems to have been a tacit attitude toward nature, a flowering forth of assumptions whose roots had been deepening and strengthening for centuries. Scientific investigation depends upon certain assumptions about the world, and science is impossible until those assumptions are in place. Western thinkers had to ascribe to nature the character and attributes that made it a possible object of scientific study in advance of the actual establishment of science. As Whitehead puts it, faith in the possibility of science came antecedently to the development of actual scientific theory. The Bible does not directly speak to science, but what it does do is lay out some key ideas about reality that are necessary in order for science to come into existence. Now, what kind of ideas do I have in mind here? Well, firstly, the universe is real. 
It's not an illusion like many Eastern religions teach. Secondly, God made the physical universe good, and therefore it is valuable and worth studying. In the 1500s, the French theologian John Calvin wrote this, There is need of art and more exacting toil in order to investigate the motion of the stars, to determine their assigned stations, to measure their intervals, to note their properties. In one of his notebooks, the famous astronomer Johannes Kepler wrote this, I give you thanks, creator and God, that you have given me this joy in your creation, and I rejoice in the works of your hands. See, I have now completed the work to which I was called. In it, I have used all the talents you have lent to my spirit. Now, thirdly, the universe is not divine, and the various parts of the universe should not be considered to be manifestations of competing deities. Again, this is significant. You're not likely to perform many experiments on the natural world if you think that those experiments are going to upset some deity. Fourthly, the universe is orderly and rational because it is governed by a rational and omnipotent God. Nobel Prize winning biochemist Melvin Calvin stated this, As I try to discern the origin of that conviction, I seem to find it in a basic notion discovered 2,000 or 3,000 years ago and enunciated first in the Western world by the ancient Hebrews, namely that the universe is governed by a single God and is not the product of the whims of many gods, each governing his own province according to his own laws. This monotheistic view seems to be the historical foundation for modern science. Now, without presuppositions like these, science is never going to get off the ground. The Christian faith is not antithetical to modern science. Just the opposite, in fact. It was the ideas that came out of a biblical worldview that laid the groundwork for the birth of modern science. Now, claim number three. There is no scientific evidence that supports any aspect of the Christian faith. Is this true? Well, to begin with, I would say that the existence of science itself points to a wise, powerful, intelligent, and good creator. In 1960, the Nobel Prize-winning physicist Eugene Wigner wrote an important essay titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. Now, in this essay, Wigner asked three big questions. Firstly, why should natural laws exist at all? This is a great question. Why should there be any sort of order in the universe? Why isn't everything chaotic and unpredictable? Why should there be natural laws at all? Secondly, given that natural laws do exist, why should we have the mental capacity to be able to discover them? Now, do you know how many species of living organisms there are on our planet? About 8.7 million. Do you know how many of those species have the ability to contemplate the laws of nature? One. Only one species. We are the only species that can contemplate the laws of nature. Now, why should we have the ability to do this? Why should it not be the case that these laws, even if they exist, are not just way beyond our ability to comprehend? I mean, clearly, we don't need this ability to survive and reproduce. I mean, the other 8.7 million species are doing just fine without that ability. So why should the laws of nature be discoverable? Philosopher Mark Steiner writes this, At the end of the 19th century, physics was at a crossroads. Scientists were attempting to describe the unseen world of the very small, and they already knew that the atomic world obeys different laws than those governing the macroscopic world. Of course, as Charles Pierce pointed out, once the laws were conjectured, one could verify them indirectly by checking their consequences for the macroscopic world, but first they had to be guessed. And Pierce himself, like John Locke before him, was pessimistic about the ability of the human species even to conjecture the laws of the atom. Evolution, he argued, could not have equipped the human species with the ability to come up with the laws of objects which play no role in our daily life. Why should we have any hope of discovering the laws of nature? 
Now, thirdly, given that the universe does have regularities and that we can discover them, why, Wigner asks, should modern mathematics, which was not developed for the purpose of describing the physical universe, end up being so effective in this task? Now, you may not know this, but mathematicians and physicists actually have very different goals. I mean, mathematicians are not really particularly interested in the physical universe. I mean, to them, mathematics is more like a highly sophisticated and very abstract game. They do mathematics because they think it's interesting and beautiful. Modern mathematical structures are nowhere near like what we see in observed reality. And this prompted Albert Einstein to ask this. How is it possible that mathematics, a product of human thought that is independent of experience, fits so excellently the objects of physical reality? Another Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steven Weinberg, writes, It is very strange that mathematicians are led by their sense of mathematical beauty to develop formal structures that physicists only later find useful, even where the mathematician had no such goal in mind. Physicists generally find the ability of mathematicians to anticipate the mathematics needed in the theories of physics quite uncanny. It is as if Neil Armstrong in 1969, when he first set foot on the surface of the moon, had found in the lunar dust the footsteps of Jules Verne. Now, Eugene Wigner was an agnostic. Even so, he called the appropriateness of the language of mathematics to the formulation of the laws of physics a miracle, a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. Wigner had no answers to the questions that he posed in his essay. If there is no God, then there is no explanation for the existence of science. On the other hand, if we adopt a biblical worldview, then the existence of science is perfectly rational. Secondly, the scientific evidence strongly suggests that the universe had a beginning and therefore some cause outside of itself. Philosopher William Lane Craig formulates an argument this way. One, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. And therefore, three, the universe has a cause. Now, it's difficult to reject this argument. Either you're going to deny the finite age of the universe, which is going to fly in the face of the best scientific theories, or you're just going to say there is no cause at all for the beginning of the universe. Now, that's no sort of explanation. It's far more rational to say that the universe has a cause for its beginning. Now, if that's the case, what could possibly be the cause of the beginning of the universe? I mean, there are not a lot of options here, right? We need something that's beginningless, powerful, intelligent, outside of the physical universe. There are not many beings that fit that description. And so for this reason, the finite age of the universe is strong evidence for the existence of God. Thirdly, the laws of physics are remarkably fine-tuned for the existence of life. So some decades ago, scientists began asking the question, are the laws of physics, the physical constants, and the conditions of our universe at the beginning generic, or are they special in some way? And what they discovered is that the universe seems to be fine-tuned especially for the existence of life. Here's what Paul Davies says. The numerical values that nature has assigned to the fundamental constants, such as the charge on the electron, the mass of the proton, and the Newtonian gravitational constant, may be mysterious, but they are crucially relevant to the structure of the universe that we perceive. As more and more physical systems, from nuclei to galaxies, have become better understood, scientists have begun to realize that many characteristics of these systems are remarkably sensitive to the precise values of the fundamental constants. Had nature opted for a slightly different set of numbers, the world would be a very different place. Probably we would not be here to see it. The physicist Freeman Dyson remarks similarly, The more I examine the universe and the details of its architecture, the more evidence, evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. Now notice what Dyson is doing here. He's personifying the universe. The universe must have known we were coming. 
There's just so much design and purpose in the natural world that it's almost impossible for scientists to avoid using language like this. And if they don't want to refer to an actual God, inevitably they end up deifying the universe. Now, fourthly, the origin of life through random processes is unimaginably improbable. It is unimaginably improbable. Scientists used to speak of the simple cell. In fact, in the 1800s, scientists thought that living things were basically made up of a fundamental substance which they called protoplasm. And early experiments seemed to confirm this. Well, as it turns out, they were just fantastically wrong. Somewhere around the mid-1900s, scientists discovered that cells are actually filled with scores of tiny molecular machines, and they perform all kinds of functions that are essential for life. A cell is a lot more like a microscopic city than it is a blob of protoplasm. Now, these little molecular machines are made out of proteins, and here a very interesting mystery emerges. The key molecular process that makes modern life possible is protein synthesis, since proteins are used in nearly every aspect of living. The synthesis of proteins requires a tightly integrated sequence of reactions, most of which are themselves performed by proteins. It takes proteins to make proteins. And this constitutes a problem. Where do you get the first proteins? I mean, even the simplest functioning proteins are unimaginably complex. The probability of getting one of these just randomly is unbelievably small. It's just never going to happen. And so we see that the existence of science itself the beginning of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe for life, and the origin of life itself all point to the existence of a powerful, intelligent, and good creator. God's fingerprints are all over nature. In the first century, the Apostle Paul wrote this, What may be known about God is plain to all people, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Now maybe you're listening to this today and you're the sort of person who needs evidence. I mean, you don't want to just blindly believe in some God. Well, I understand that. I'm wired that way too. I don't want to take some blind leap of faith that doesn't, isn't based on reality, but that's not what following Jesus is like. The good news is that God has provided us evidence, and if we will take small steps based on the evidence that God has given us, he will show us even more. Oh, you can take a step of faith today because it's not based on just guesswork and blind faith. It's based on what God has, been, has made known about himself. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. God, we give you praise today. There is no one like you. God, we thank you. Lord, that you are not hiding from us. But Lord, you have made yourself known through what you have made. Lord God, right now, I'm praying that you would give every one of us the ability to see with fresh eyes how you've revealed yourself in your creation. Just while we're in this moment of prayer, maybe you're thinking to yourself today, I'm ready to take a step. I don't know everything, but God is showing me something and I want to take a step. If that's you today, let me encourage you to pray a very simple prayer. God, here I am. I put my trust in you. I want to know you. I want to serve you. And God, I pray that as I take these steps, you will show me more about who you are and what you have for my life. Lord God, I thank you that when we pray simple prayers like that, you meet us. You meet us right where we are and you begin to make all things new from the inside out. Lord God, have your way in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.